authoritarian governments seem to have a thing for grand construction projects. As far as I can tell, the general principle behind these is uh, the bigger and more elaborate, the better. Um, Americans have a tendency to get jealous of these things. We look at these projects and we see, uh, or we think we see, the power of benevolent dictators to transform their societies for the good in a way that our bickering elected officials supposedly can't. What we miss uh, in our jealousy, though, is how often these projects fail. Last year, for example, uh, James Traub, a journalist, wrote an article for a foreign policy magazine um, arguing that the United States could learn a lot from all the shiny new infrastructure China's built in its cities in the last few years. The same day uh, Traub's essay appeared in Foreign Policy, the New York Times ran a story about a 330-foot section of bridge in the Chinese city of Harbin that had collapsed just nine months after it was built. That collapse killed three people and injured five more. And at the time, it was the sixth major bridge collapse in China just in the past year. Back in May 2008, um, when a huge earthquake hit China's Sichuan province, hundreds of school buildings in the region just crumbled, often while buildings nearby remained standing. The Chinese government had built those schools, and thousands of children died when they collapsed. Of course, uh, one of the worst and most spectacular failures of infrastructure in modern times happened not that far from here uh, in Ukraine back in April 1986. That's when the atomic energy plant at Chernobyl suffered this catastrophic meltdown, spewing radioactive particles over a large swath of the what was then the Soviet Union in Europe. One UN report described Chernobyl as the worst environmental disaster in human history. So what's going on here? If dictators are supposed to be so good at building things, then why do so many of the things they build end up failing so terribly? I think we can start to answer this question by looking for flaws in the mental models many of us have about how authoritarian regimes survive. Um, theories of political change from the 1950s and 60s have led us to expect countries to become more democratic as they become richer, uh, more industrialized, more urbanized, and get better educated. This whole cluster of social and economic changes was dubbed modernization, and this modernization process was supposed to change citizens' values and interests in a more liberal direction, while also making it easier for them to organize against their authoritarian rulers. So in other words, modernization is supposed to both encourage and enable people to demand democracy. But um, as countries like Saudi Arabia and Singapore and now China and Vietnam uh, show, this doesn't always happen. So in a kind of addendum to modernization theory, we're told that transitions to democracy in these cases have been delayed by an implicit social contract between rulers and their people. And uh, under this contract, um, the regime is supposed to supply an improving standard of living, and in return, uh, citizens supply their loyalty to the regime. So now, instead of producing pressures for economic reform, uh, uh, excuse me, for political reform, economic growth is said to lend performance legitimacy to the autocrats who are able to, to supply it, at least while it lasts. Then as a result, uh, the transition to democracy is delayed until economic growth finally slows down, performance legitimacy evaporates with it, and this supposed social contract is finally broken. But here again, uh, if performance legitimacy is the foundation these regimes stand on, then these collapsing bridges and schools and exploding power plants are big screw-ups, and they really shouldn't happen. If dictators were serious about upholding some kind of social contract with their citizens, you'd think they would buy the best materials and hire the best builders and conduct really good inspections to make sure, uh, partly to protect their investments in these projects, but more importantly, to protect the lives of the people who use them. But clearly, that's not what happens. So why not? Well, here's the thing. This supposed social contract isn't real. It's really a philosopher's device for deducing why government ought to exist, not a historian's description of how states have actually come to be. Uh, in fact, as the 
great sociologist Charles Tilley liked to point out, states in the real world have traditionally looked more like protection rackets than public services. Leaders uh, and their entourages are much more concerned with protecting their own wealth and privileges than the welfare of the people they rule. And when those leaders aren't competitively elected, their wealth and privileges don't depend much on how most people uh, feel about them. Instead, they depend a lot more on the loyalty of a much smaller coalition of people with especially important skills and assets. Things like guns and land and big bank accounts and the right social connections. Once we um, recognize that authoritarian regimes are really just organizations of people basically looking out for themselves, uh, it's easier to see that these big construction projects aren't just about producing public goods to help grow the economy and make citizens happy. They're also, and maybe more so, an important way for cronies to cash out their political capital. Elites offer their loyalty to the regime in exchange for privileged access to things like state-controlled loans, and licenses, and construction tenders. The projects that come out of this can have some public benefit, for sure, um, but at the same time, they're physical manifestations of this deeper political economy in which citizens uh, aren't so much constituents or even customers, really, of the authoritarian regime as they are resources and potentially threats. In this version of the world, dictators don't bother to buy the best materials and hire the best builders and all that. Um, they, uh, instead, they're more likely to invest whatever spare resources they have in instruments of monitoring and repression to keep people from getting organized against them. These guys aren't benevolent modernizers building a better future for their people. They're more like mafia bosses building the political machinery that's meant to help them get and stay rich and powerful. Political machinery generally works better when those leaders don't spend a lot of time looking over their cronies' shoulders, bugging them about how the physical machinery is getting made. Um, we can see this dynamic uh, pretty clearly in the aftermath of that 2008 earthquake in Sichuan. In hindsight, it was evident that the flaw that caused so many schools to collapse there wasn't in the building codes, which in this case were actually pretty stringent. Instead, the flaw was in the failure to follow those codes, and the root cause of that failure was corruption. Um, according to parents who organized and investigated after the disaster happened, local officials and builders had cut lots of corners in the construction of those school buildings and then bribed inspectors to ignore uh, all the flaws in the work they'd done. In short, um, dictators build things that fall apart because those things weren't just built to keep citizens happy. They were also built to keep the dictator's friends happy, and as it turns out, those friends aren't always so interested in making sure the things they build actually work. These projects aren't gifts from benevolent dictators to their grateful people. They're more like the packaging left over from gifts the dictators give to their loyal friends and themselves. Now, there are a couple of ironies here. The first is that we can only really understand why dictators build things that fall apart by thinking about what holds the regimes themselves together. These failures, in a sense, are a direct consequence of the design of authoritarian rule. The corruption that's like a glue for the regime is like a solvent for the things it builds. Uh, the second irony, and the idea I'd like to close with this afternoon, um, is that the, uh, the aggressive development we often credit with helping sustain these regimes actually carries some of the most fertile seeds of their destruction. While we're busy admiring the booming industry and the shiny infrastructure, local residents are often suffering through forced evictions, train crashes, bridge collapses, polluted air and water. Uh, these problems aren't just nuisances on the way to a bigger bank account. They're often matters of life and death. And the real human costs of these public failures often motivate people to organize and demand reform, even while their economies are still growing briskly. China, for example, um, has reportedly experienced tens of thousands of mass incidents, as the government calls them, uh, every year for at least the past several years. 
these incidents, including this one um, in Kidong last summer over plans to construct a new sewage pipeline at a plant there, these incidents have mushroomed. Even while China's economy has been growing at rates, most of the world can only envy. According to a recently retired senior party official, pollution is now the chief cause of that unrest. I'm sure um, that Chinese officials are painfully aware that many of the nationalist uprisings that eventually led to the collapse of the Soviet Union actually started out as environmental movements, and the disaster at Chernobyl played an important role in catalyzing those early protests. Uh, Russia also saw a new wave of political activism start in late 2011. And again, contrary to this performance legitimacy model, this new activism uh, got started after a couple of years of solid economic growth. Uh, lots of the participants in this activism have been middle class urbanites, the very people who are supposed to be benefiting most from Russia's economic rebound. Now, um, election fraud was clearly the immediate trigger to this new wave of, uh, of activism in Russia, but long standing frustrations over things like shoddy health care aggressive urban development, and even simple stuff like this pothole in Yekaterinburg um, have helped to motivate and sustain that activism. The fact is authoritarian regimes survive in spite of unrest, not because unrest is absent. The chief obstacle to reform in these cases isn't citizen satisfaction with their ruler's performance. It's state repression, which makes it really hard for people who aren't satisfied with their ruler's performance with people who are being harmed by these public failures to organize and do something about it. Uh, these protests over um, these threats to public health and safety seem to worry state officials in a way that protests over more abstract issues like free speech and free elections don't always. I actually think they have their priorities right on this one. Um, if my point about the nature of authoritarian rule is correct, then the popular uprisings it's going to take to finally push countries like China and Russia toward more democratic politics probably aren't going to be led by citizens frustrated because their paychecks aren't growing as fast anymore. Um, instead, I think they're more likely to happen when the swirl of smaller outbursts over things like smoggy air or collapsing bridges or tainted milk finally coalesce into a sustained attempt to throw the bums out. I'm not going to try to predict um, when those uprisings are going to happen. When they do, though, I suspect we'll be able to trace their origins, at least in part, right back to the failure of some of the very projects we're so busy admiring now. Thank you.